Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you today to our Pellegrino Symposium presented by the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics at Georgetown University. Our topic is medical education for moral enterprise. And before I welcome our guests, I'd also like to, as I have, welcome all of you. And if you have questions during the session, I will try to get to them as possible. And if you put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, those will get relayed to me. And I really would look forward to sharing as many as I can um, as we move forward. Our guests for this conversation this afternoon are Dr. David Scordon. Dr. Scordon is president and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges. He trained as a cardiologist and has served as president of the University of Iowa, as well as Cornell University. And then prior to assuming his leadership position at the AAMC, he was secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Lee Jones is Dean for Medical Education at Georgetown University Medical School. And he began this position in 2021. A psychiatrist by training, Lee was one year behind me at Dartmouth College. So uh, we're just rabid big greeners. Dr. Jones has had a long career in medical education. He came to Georgetown from the University of California at San Francisco, where he's Associate Dean for Medical Education. As a member of the AAMC, where he's on the board in his role at Georgetown, Dr. Jones has been an advocate for diversity, equity, and an inclusive culture for all, including LGBTQ students and faculty. I'm Miles Sheehan. I'm the director of the Pellegrino Center here at Georgetown. In addition to being trained in internal medicine and geriatrics, as well as ethics, uh, I am a Jesuit priest. Let's get the conversation started. So Dr. Scordon and Dr. Jones, this conversation comes out of reflection on some significant moments over the past couple of years. There's been the COVID pandemic, and which continues to have its effects, of course. There's the death of George Floyd. There's the ongoing revelation of structural inequity and injustice in our country, as well as in medical healthcare, American healthcare. And there are increased demands to improve medical education and healthcare with a goal of first improving healthcare, of course, but to eliminate some of these inequities and justice. We need to prevent provide good care for all people. Now, along with these events, a little bit more locally here at Georgetown, we've had a series of sessions, one sponsored by the AAMC, looking at the role of physicians in Nazi Germany and the way that, here was one of the things I learned that I didn't know to my shame. I thought the doctors were just sort of forced into it and maybe some of them were complicit, but it was a little bit like they had a gun at their head. That wasn't the case. Uh, the physicians are ushered in the horrors of the Holocaust by their advocacy and complicity in programs that murdered individuals who were deemed defective because of illness, developmental disabilities, and other illnesses. They started this program before the war began and the so-called technology developed led to the destruction of over 6 million Jews and many other peoples during World War II. I think most chilling, these physician leaders in Germany felt that their murderous policies were based on sound science. And they used their ideology as the basis for killing those that they decided were unworthy of life. In the context of this year's Pellegrino Symposium, I'm hoping we can talk about how we educate students as well as others in medical training so that they're faithful to what Dr. Pellegrino called the moral enterprise of medicine. In a world where we can disagree about a lot of ethical issues, what Pellegrino noted was that the patient-physician interaction is a place where the goal of finding the right healing action for the patient gives us a moral touchstone. It's a place where doctors work to serve the patient's good in the context of that relationship. Now, Pellegrino focused on the need for the physician to ascertain, determine, work with the patient to discover the patient's own sense of what is his or her personal good, their good as a human being with dignity and autonomy, and their personal deepest sense of meaning or spiritual good. And what the physician's job is, is to try to find the right biomedical good or action to match those goods to the patient. 
considering the legacies of medicine from the Holocaust, as well as those barriers to equity and access in our own healthcare system, obviously there's an ongoing need to educate those who will be physicians to respect and care for those persons who come to them as patients. If we don't value them as human beings, how can we care about what is good and most important to them? That was a little bit of a long-winded introduction. Dr. Scordon and Jones, you've both spoken about how experience of the Holocaust has influenced you. Given your role as medical educators, does this give you any pause, any thought, any insight into what elements over and above the basic and clinical sciences should be part of the curriculum? David, could I start with you? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here and congratulations on uh, not only the symposium, but on all that you're doing, Dr. Sheehan. Um, it's easy for me to say this, but I do think it's important to incorporate the history of medicine, including but not limited to the Holocaust, into the medical curriculum. All of us, in my view, must be able to recognize and challenge problematic ideologies and practices and in an ideal world, stop them in their tracks while having respect for the concept of free speech. And this can be a, a tough needle to thread, but I believe it's one we need to pay attention to at all times. When we confront the role of medicine, for example, as Dr. Sheehan said in the Holocaust, we can inform the ethical practice of medicine in our own times and beyond. I wanna take just a quick moment uh, for definitional purposes. Uh, some uh, ethicists and others differentiate between the word ethics and the word morality. Mm -hmm. uh, some think that uh, morality uh, and ethics, of course, both have to do with distinguishing right from wrong. Some, sometimes people will say that morality typically is more personal, describing an individual compass or action, whereas ethics typically can describe the standards of a social system like a community or institution. I believe today's discussion, in my view, touches on both. And so I'm going to be using, um, and I apologize in advance if I do them incorrectly, I'm going to be using ethics and morals more or less interchangeably. I think, to, as I mentioned, today's discussion does touch on both the need to adhere to a generally accepted set of principles in medicine, as well as to have a personal moral code of right and wrong. This is important, not just because of the Holocaust significance in history, but also because of what these concepts mean today as we continue to experience and are called to counter all forms of racism, hate, intolerance, a resurgence of anti-Semitism, as well as the targeted violence and continued division that racism and hate breed among us. So I think as hard as it is to shoehorn even more into a very crowded and ever-changing medical curriculum, I do think it's important. Thank you. Thank you, David Lee. Um, in one of the presentations here at Georgetown, you talked a little bit about your experience as a high school student um, in Europe and visiting one of the concentration camps. Could you share a little bit about that and then also talk about some of the things that David mentioned about how that influences your approach to medical education? Absolutely. So I had the good fortune to be an exchange student to Germany and Switzerland. And um, kudos to them for giving us a very lengthy module on um, the history of the not of Nazis and fascism in Europe. And so part of our school education, the experiential part of it, is we visited um, actually four or five of the uh, of the camps and it, it was devastating. Um, I was 15 at the time. Uh, I thought I knew what evil was and what um, you know, what we were capable of as human beings. And I mean, I'm starting to shake inside just thinking about that. I, I just remember we went from being 15 year old kids on a bus, you know, joking and laughing to words, not a word spoken for hours after we left. Um, it, it was beyond eye opening. I, most of us didn't sleep that night. And so fast forward, I'm a physician, I've, I'm trained in psychiatry. So, you know, one of the things that, that I understand is that our species is a species that is habits. We have a lot of um, hard wiring. Oh, I, I hate that term because we can modify it. We have a lot of wiring um, in our, you know, our 
pre-mammalian brain, our reptile brain, we have reflexes that we have to work on overcoming. And so one of the things that David highlighted is really understanding what happened, uh, the, the level of tragedy, the level of devastation, the complete injustice of what happened is a step, it's an important step, it's the first step. Um, and what, what the education, what we need to do in education is make sure that that recognition, that history, the lessons learned that need to be relearned are kept at the front of mind. We need to be vigilant that these issues, that the preventative approaches that, that we are all have attempted uh, need to be at front of mind. And like many things in medicine, you can't do it once. It's not one and done. It's a continual effort. And so that's the important part of what our education is. And keeping in mind that medical education starts in medical school, if not before, but that continues for lifelong. So it's not just about what we teach in medical school um, in the curriculum. It's about what we teach in residency and fellowships and CME and what becomes an integral part of being a physician in this country and around the world. Uh, so I completely agree with what, what David said is, is that, and we continue to see examples as we all know, you listed several and there's so many things going on in Africa and Asia and you know just around the world and in our own backyard in this country that tells me that we're not learning the lessons or paying attention to them all the time. So we really have to create a habit with our um, future physicians and current physicians of stepping back and recognizing what's going on and feeling the responsibility to do something about it. Thank you, Lee. You know, it's obvious and to state what the what physicians did to lay the groundwork for the Holocaust and their use of supposed scientific principles as a basis for murder is reprehensible. It also, uh, personally was a profoundly shocking thing to watch Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck for how many minutes? I think it was 10 minutes. Nine. Nine. Nine minutes. And then the other powerful thing, Martin Tobin, who was a pulmonologist at Loyola Chicago Medical Center, um, he was the expert witness at the trial. And uh, Dr. Tobin is not only a renowned pulmonologist, but he is an exquisite master of the art of physical diagnosis. And he just went through the tape in excruciating detail about George Floyd's last life, last moments of life. Those kinds of visceral body blocks when you go, this is horror in front of us. Um, that's one thing. Do you think that our processes of medical education generate enough critical thinking on how we respect individuals and the dignity, the sacredness, the value of their lives, Dave? Um, I, I wanna say this gently, but, but clearly I, I don't think they do. And the reason I say I don't think they do is that we're never done with that task of trying to do better. In, in his very eloquent comments, Dr. Jones, uh, use the word habit toward the end of, of his answer uh, to you, uh, Dr. Shan. And that idea of habits of mind is something that we need to consistently and constantly and repeatedly build. The, the vision that you brought up, Dr. Shan, of uh, Derek Chauvin's uh, knee, and George Floyd's neck is horrible. And I can never get it out of my mind. Mm -hmm. But for every overt situation like that, there's more that you can't tell the damage that's being done just by running a videotape. And so I think we have to have the habits of mind of thinking about the relationships between people, our respect, our true respect for each other, and our understanding that we're never done, we're never done developing those habits of mind and never done learning from each other. And of course, as I mentioned before, the medical curriculum is not only full but under constant pressure to add new things. But I think if I can paraphrase what Dr. Jones said so eloquently, that the habits of mind that we have to develop are important. And one theme I'd like to sound, uh, Dr. Sheehan, is that um, as important as the STEM disciplines are to medical education, and they're critically, critically important, our thorniest problems as a society, in my view, and as individuals are not gonna be solved by science alone. And so I think 
the arts and the humanities, and in this particular case of ethics, the humanities and philosophy are incredibly important. And I don't think we're ever done trying to do better because uh, evil, if I could use that word, has a way of showing itself in different forms. Challenges to ethics and morals have a way of showing themselves in different forms. We have to be ever vigilant and ever more active developing and cultivating these habits of mind. So no, I don't think we're done. Thank you. Lee? Completely agree. Um, completely agree. I mean, I think it's been, as David highlighted, that it's been a increasing focus to look at, you know, which is difficult because as David has said, you know, there's so much more knowledge. When I think about what is different from when I went to medical school and now, and that medical school is only still four years, not, and I'm not advocating that it could be any longer, there's, there's a crowding effect there. And what we've been able to do over the years is not just think about the biomedical, but looking at behavioral, educational, pedagogy, social and health system sciences, population science, and the humanities. And what that's really brought is experiential. I remember when I was learning how to drive, I grew up in a rural part of um, Northern Maine and upstate New York. And my uncle in New York City um, said, you gotta learn how to drive in New York. And we were at a four-way stop sign. And I stopped to look at the other three people to see who was going to go. And my uncle jumped on me and said, don't look people in the eyes. If you look them in the eyes, you can't cut them off. <laughs> um, I was just like, whoa, that's sort of harsh. But I think that really speaks to what we do as human beings. And if it's experiential and if it's not just something on a page, but if it jumps up at you and you repeatedly are reminded about it and the importance of it, it becomes, as David said, a habit of mind. And, you know, we, we know how to do that in medicine. We teach critical thinking around differential diagnosis. And we all know that if, you know, someone comes in with chest pain and you immediately go to cardiac, it makes it much more difficult to actually pull yourself back out and think about all the other things. You need to start with sort of a growth mindset and approach there. And so, yeah, it, it is just, we're not there. It's a continual process. And I said, across the spectrum, it's not like you, even if you get to maximize which you really can't in medical school, there's residency and then there's practice. And the last thing I'll say is that, and, and David, you alluded to this, is that people typically, physicians don't get into trouble so much for lack of knowledge, that does happen. It's for lack of behavior or understanding or connection with people. When you look at what medical boards are dealing with, it's much more around ethics and moral issues. Um, and so we really need to think about how we can do that. And, you know, our growth mindset, I, we used to believe that people were, you know, had a fixed mindset, what you were, you know, got at birth is what you, what you have for the rest of your life. We know that's not true. And that's not true for skills around communication, for listening, um, as well as empathy and connecting. So we have, we, our work is cut out for us. There's job security here for us. You know, could I, uh, could, I uh, could I interject okay. something? Uh, sorry, Dr. Sheehan, for cutting you off. Um, that's so important what Dr. Jones just said, and I, I want to introduce one other concept that I that to me anyway fits in with the wisdom he just shared. There, there's this um, Zen Buddhist concept of beginner's mind that was expressed mm -hmm. well by late the late monk Shenryu Suzuki, um, and the quote I, this is approximate. I'm trying to do it from memory. Is in the um, expert's mind, excuse me, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And the example that Dr. Jones gave, walking in, someone has chest pain, you go right away to cardiac, and that's the end of it. The, to have an open mind about everything in every encounter is so hard to do. But if we came, even if we moved in the direction of the ideal that Dr. Jones outlined, how much better we would be as physicians and as people in every human encounter that we, that we enjoy, to have an open mind and not to assume right away that we're gonna drill right down on what the answer must be. So I think it's a very important point that Dr. Jones made that to me at least touches on that, con that Zen concept of beginner's mind. And I think it's critically important. You know, just to follow up on what you both have been talking about, one of the things that, Dr. Pellegrino talked about, and it's also something that's written a lot about in ethics is about education and virtue with virtue being a habit that you develop just as the same way that like if you exercise, you develop 
different parts of your body. So if you behave in a way that is prudent or courageous or temperate or just, then you become that person by sort of transferring that potential energy into kinetic energy. And part of the things that is important about that are role models. Um, you know, I was thinking of, for example, David Leach, the former director of the um, ACGME, who I got to know really well in Chicago, who helped me to look at medical education and the curriculum as a way to not simply instill knowledge, but a way to deepen the way we encounter each other as learners along with our patients. Can you talk a little bit about role modeling in your lives and what you think might be the importance of that for the future? David? The importance of role, role models? Yeah. Un unbelievably important. And if I, by the word role model, I could extend that to be mentors, if that's mm -hmm. acceptable. Um, I think that um, hopefully, no matter how superannuated we are, and I speak from experience, um, you never, never uh, give up the ability to learn from people, especially people, most particularly people who are not in a position where you would think, well, this, this, is, this is my mentor. I'll give you a real quick vignette. Um, my first, uh, first day of my, what used to be called internship right after medical school at UCLA, we walked in for orientation. They handed us a piece of paper. They said, find your name on the piece of paper. I found my name. They said, see if you have an asterisk next to your name. I looked, there was an asterisk. They said, if there's an asterisk, you're on today and there's patients waiting upstairs to be admitted. So please go upstairs. We'll finish the orientation later. So I went upstairs and they said, uh, we have two patients for you. One is having a GI bleed. This is before the days of critical care specialists. And they said, that patient's in the ICU. And I said, right, I'm ready to do that. I know what to do. And the other one is someone with hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. And I went blank. I went blank. And I said to the charge nurse, um, do you happen to have an a internal medicine textbook? And she looked at the fear in my eyes and she said, this is an order sheet. I'd like you to sit down and here's a pen. And here's some things I think you may want to do for this patient. And she dictated to me the different things that had to be done. I wrote them down. The patient did well. And um, I was not expecting when I went to UCLA with my burnished brand new MD, uh, all shiny and new, that I would be mentored by a nurse. But that nurse, make no mistake about it, that nurse saved that patient's life through her agency. And so I, I do think it's important. And I think it's very important to have our eyes open and our minds open again to wisdom wherever it can come and not to allow ourselves to be too, uh, what's the word, too hierarchical in our thinking about where I'm gonna get my information. Information uh, is plentiful, sometimes not reliable in certain venues, but I think people's wisdom and their lived experiences are an incredible source of wisdom that I'm still learning how to, how to fathom. And I'm still very much uh, away from where I should be in terms of learning from others who are not obvious card carrying mentors. And so I just wanted to make that point, Dr. Sheehan. Thank you. Blake? Yeah, I would add, a, David, I love what you said. And so to that, I would add, you know, when you say role model, I think we think of like the pillar of light, the, you know, the person that is everything. And I, when I think of role models, I think of a little bit of like what to wear and what not to wear. I don't know if you remember that TV show. It's like, why are you wearing those socks? They don't go. And I think we all get examples in our daily lives, particularly in medicine, of great ways to be and not so great ways to be. Unfortunately, you know, because we see people at their best and at their worst, both patients and their families, as well as colleagues. And I think about the times that I've really learned from role models, it's been a chunk here or a piece there of, I like the way they said that, or I hadn't thought about the importance of that. And being able to, to step back and look at Importantly, the broad brush strokes, because there are people that are very inspiring and are amazing role models. But as you brought up, David, there can be people that you people in situations that you least expect you will learn from. And I, those are like wonderful treats for me. I'm going to embarrass you, David. So, you know, I'm on the board. David is has been an outstanding leader. And I remember when you first came on, the, the motto was learn, serve, lead. And he said, 
which of those do we do well? And which of those don't we do? And what can we improve on? And just the ability to take something that is a given, right? That's on the wall and ask us to step back. That was, that was um, a pivotal point for the board. Um, and so that, just to give it an example, and because I also enjoy embarrassing David a little bit of, um, it's amazing how someone can ask a simple question and that changes your thought. And that's a role modeling point there. So I, I think it's very important to pick and choose. And the other thing is to recognize that there are human frailties, right? We're not all perfect. And to hold someone up to be a full role model isn't recognize them as a human being, right? And then that's part of being a role model is I have frailties that just like you, I struggle with and I'm working on. And that's been the other thing that role models and mentors have, have taught me is it's okay. It's like, welcome to the human race. Um, and we're in this together. So I love, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am without role models and mentors. I suspect that's true for all of us that are successful. I really love what you said. You know, some of the people I most admire are the ones who will talk about their mistakes, um, whether it is the brutal honesty of sometimes seen in surgical morbidity and mortality conferences or uh, a good friend who was in charge of a residency program and, you know, just said something inappropriate about a patient in terms of not liking the patient. And then the patient overheard it. And mm -hmm. then um how he used that as an experience both he did a little penance by telling all the residents about what he did wrong why it was wrong and how he has to make amends and try and grow from that i mean that was very very powerful for those group of people just to switch it a little bit and one of the things that i think about with our progress in medical sciences and then looking again at science is sort of an ideology that's used as something that's always going to grow, always going to move forward. If we can discover it, we should do it. Um, I occasionally think that we can move too fast with implementing or pursuing some discoveries. An egregious example would be what happened with the investigator who used CRISPR editing on embryos um, and essentially there were multiple ethical problems that were wrong with that. The hubris that seems to be behind it was we have this fascinating new technology, so let's use it and let's be the, one of the first to use it. Um, there is a um, ethicist at Dalhousie in Canada, Francois Bailey. She talks about slow science and fast science and that she and others are often criticized by saying that ethics is behind, is slowing down science and we need to catch up. Recognizing that this can be a, a little bit of a neuralgic um, discussion considering some of the important stakeholders um, that we have in medical education. Can you comment on how we as human beings, as other professionals should take a look at the enterprise of science research from an extraordinarily favorable perspective, but also one to use some caution. I'm happy to start. So as you were talking, I was thinking about technology in general and how many of us struggle with Zoom and <laughs> things moving forward, right? There's, there's, there's many ways that the human experience, things around us are moving faster and beyond our current capabilities. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I just, it's like, I'm not going to play that computer game because I end up in a corner, you know, in the wall facing things instead of actually participating. And I, I think I like the thought about fast science and slow science. You know, I think starting with the question of, am I allowing the ends to justify my means here, which we often don't ask, and you highlighted, you know, what you said, Miles, of if we can do it, we should do it, as opposed if we can do it, we should think about it and think about how and when we should do it. Um, who's affected by this work? What are the positive potentials? And what are the negative potentials? Where could this go that's not great? Um, and thinking about what kind of safeguards do we put in there? And when you look at history, you know, Henrietta Lacks, people being 
used in ways that that and the, the Holocaust, I mean, there's, it's not just Germany, our country has done it and continues to do things like that. Um, slowing down and taking a deep breath and really asking about what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Who's being affected? And part of the problem with science is it's gotten so competitive, right? You, you, you need to get it published before somebody else does. Uh, and that causes, you know, anytime something is rushed, things can go awry and, and often do. So I completely agree with the sentiment you expressed of and maybe not so much slowing down, but just being thoughtful about it, which to some people, I guess, would seem like slowing down, but how is thoughtful a bad thing? And you know, uh, that was again, so so eloquent. Um, I would just add a couple minor things to, to the very strong, important points Dr. Jones just made. One is, um, and I don't, I don't wanna come off uh, Dr. Sheehan as anti-science today, but, but one is that we may believe sometimes a little too much in medical science in terms of solving problems. And um, uh, I'm a cardiologist and when we were learning about the effects of uh, behavior in addition to genetics, um, it, it became pretty obvious that there were things that one could do on, on one's own that didn't require uh, papers uh, initially in journals, although you like to make sure that there's evidence based on large population studies and didn't require uh, new things, new stuff, new, uh, new devices, new diagnostic things, new, new, new drugs that could make a palpable difference. And so that's, that's a sort of an obvious uh, old time example. Another uh, important uh, thing to remember, I, I would say, is that we've evolved in our point of view of what it is that affects health, not healthcare, but health. Certainly, uh, except for uh, very important uh, uh, single gene defects, genetics you know, has a certain, depending on the population you look at, perhaps is responsible for 10 to 20% of, of what affects health, something like that. And medical care, all of us with stethoscopes around our necks, not 60, 70%, maybe another 15 or 20%. And the rest, uh, and there's abundant evidence to show this, despite some pushback from some quarters, are the social determinants of health and their precursors, racism, poverty. And so these are things that we need to work on that uh, it's not a matter of, as, as Dr. Jones wisely said, it's not a matter of slowing down science. It's a matter of making sure that we have our eye on the ball. The ball is health. The ball is health. And if the ball is health and we're keeping our eye on the ball, we're certainly going to want to move research along at the appropriate pace with the appropriate safeguards and the appropriate data. But we're also going to want, again, to look beyond uh, biological science to look at social science and other areas in which how people live and how we treat each other and what sort of sociological things occur in the country because they can have enormous, enormous, enormous impacts. Last thing about science is um, we have to call out, I believe in this discussion, the special case of those who have um, uh, a terrible disease that's not shared by a large number of people and therefore will not uh, obviously be profitable to a, uh, develop a procedure, a device, a drug. And we have to make sure that we have a place in our hearts and in our economies for taking care of those who are facing uh, perhaps certain death and where something could be done, but all of the economic and social structures around it don't necessarily deal with a narrow group of people ha having a defect. And science, because of the competitive nature of what Dr. Jones was mentioning, sometimes will go to those with a, with a larger group affected. So it's a very important thing that you brought up, Dr. Sheehan, and I, I thank you for doing so. If I may add just a couple of things, um, I, I really appreciate what you said, David, really good points and incredibly well put. I think we can step back and actually anchor this even in clinical care. I did my first fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I was on a couple of protocols where we were dealing with terminal, end stage, um, malignant melanoma, widely metastatic, failed 
treatments, although at the time we, we would say that the person failed the treatment, which always, I just didn't understand. It's like, no, the treatment failed the person. Um, and it, where it's not just science, because there were times that we had the uh, ability to offer someone their 11th round cycle of chemotherapy when the first 10 didn't work. And I think we have an obligation there to also think about, I guess that is partially science because we're, you know, everyone's on a study for that, but it's also about clinical care there that, and we do, I think as clinicians, we do that. I hope we're doing that every day is that we present the options and as best we can, the likelihood for those things clinically and, and science shouldn't be any different. Um, in many ways, we, we have experience and how to do that and making sure we're painting a full picture of what could happen here to allow people to make the most informed decisions that aren't, that aren't written in stone. You can go home and come back. You can stay and go home. Um, and, but it, it's not just science. It's anchored in the very practice of what we do in medicine. Thank you. Lee, you know, when you look at um, applicants to medical school, um, are there certain basic values we should be looking for? And do you think we encourage and foster growth in those values during the time of medical education? A great question. And we've had multiple, so I, I, multiple discussions. I, you know, I'm now in my 10th month here at, um, at Georgetown and we're a Jesuit institution where cure personnel is care of the entire person is, um, you know, a century old, dedication of a Jesuit principle. In my mind, it's it's the medicine writ large principle. So what are those? A compassion, integrity, respect and dignity of the individual and of communities um, and populations. Professionalism, we're a profession, we have responsibilities. Um, we take on those responsibilities, we take an oath. Um, looking at equity, inclusion and diversity, someone who is committed to lifelong learning and really committed and both you and David have talked about, you know, healthcare for all is, you know, as you very eloquently said, David, it's, we're, we're focused on health. That's the ball we're keeping our eyes on and improving the human condition. And so I think, you know, we're blessed with having many, many, many applicants. It is challenging when you've got 16,000 applications to how do you get down to a class of 203? That's what we're doing at Georgetown. Um, and how do you how do you look for that? Um, and again, keeping in mind that I believe in a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. So that even if you bring people in, that that how could you possibly find someone that's got strengths in in all of those areas? There are ways to address them, and and you know we do that through things like this. We do that through the you know the Holocaust program that WMC put on that many of us across the country joined. We do that with patient panels. We do that with making sure students rotate through a variety of places, getting to see the spectrum of people's lived experiences. And then we also take advantage of having diversity within, within the cohorts of the resident, of the student, you know, the, the, the class of, in medical school and learning from each other. It, it's very important to do that. But how do you, how do you make that set? You, you call it out, you name it, you make it something teachable and you make it something accessible. And I don't mean accessible as in sorting, I mean accessible as in supporting so that you give people the skills and the tools to assess where am I with this? What are my goals? Where am I, what am I striving for here? And how do I assess moving forward with that? And we have those tools. Um, and as both David and you have said, integrating the social sciences, the humanities, um, think about it. So one of the things that we can do to help is when we bring in a diverse class that are scientists, that are social scientists, that are humanities. And when I think about who I learned from across my career, it was often people that, you know, had PhDs and were unbelievable scientists. And it was also often people that were dancers uh, or was a Navy SEAL or something like that. So there are a variety of ways that we can think about how do we bring people in? How do we value it? How do we communicate the, the valuation of it? And how do we teach it? And how do we give people the skills to have lifelong assessment of where they are? Because we all, 
I don't think most of us don't get up in the morning saying, I'm going to be mean, or I'm going to be a jerk, or I'm going to do something discriminatory. But we do that. You know, things happen. We make mistakes. And giving us the space to, to be um, vulnerable and explore that and ask other people to help us explore that, that's how we move things forward. That's, um, that's so, so beautifully said. And um, we really didn't rehearse this, Dr. Sheehan, but... <laughs> Um, when, when Dr. Jones touched on assessment, there's one uh, still small but new program at the AAMC I'd like to share just, just very, very quickly. We've been developing for some years. It's called the preview um, exam. And um, it's, a, it's a way to, um, to go beyond academics to help evaluate an applicant's uh, ethics and, and cultural competence and resilience and teamwork, et cetera. And just last month, this new test launched. And to Dr. Jones's point, it's not meant as a sorting procedure. It's meant as an additional positive point for an applicant who, you know, where, wherever he or she falls on some other category, um, shows real strength in some of these areas. And I was too challenged to figure out how to get this on the screen. So I'm just going <laughs> to read it. A part of it for me, Dr. Sheehan, I know you're a geriatrician. I was actually born before the discovery of electrons. So I came honestly to the idea that I, I just don't, can't do this stuff. But um, the, these, are, these are some of the attributes we're, that we're trying to assess through this preview. By the way, um, Dr. Jones, 18 uh, medical schools have now uh, picked this up. So we'll, we'll see how, what their experience is. One is service orientation. One is social skills. One is cultural competence. One is teamwork. One, apropos to today, is ethical responsibility to self and others. One is resilience and adaptability. One is reliability and dependability. And the last, very importantly, to one of Dr. Jones's points, is the capacity for improvement or growth, the growth mindset. And um, it's, it's being well, well received as an additional positive force for an applicant who has strength in these disciplines uh, or, or attributes, I should call them. And so we're trying to make an attempt to do that one piece of what Dr. Jones was sharing to, to assess. And this is not meant to assess over time, but just to help us recognize that we have some fantastic people out there with these attributes. And we ought to count those attributes in our holistic thinking about who gets into medical school classes. So um, keep your eyes peeled for the, for the preview program. Very exciting, thank you. Yeah, um, the AAMC strategic plan um, that's out there promotes, seeks to promote diversity in medical students as well as advance health equity and justice. Dr. Scorn, can you talk a little bit about some of the parts of that strategic plan? Well, I was sort of hoping you would ask that. And, <laughs> and again, uh, because, because of my clumsiness, with technology. And, and um, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, electrons were discovered when I was a fourth year student in med school, but it was a little <laughs> too late for me to do that. Um, we're trying all kinds of things um, uh, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and anti-racism. Um, we're first asking ourselves as leaders, if you will, to look in the mirror and to recognize our own issues. Um, and, the, and the way that's been operationalized within the, the, the narrow confines of the actual AAMC association, the, the employees, is we have uh, are doing some training mandatory for me and the people uh, at the very top in terms of leadership responsibility, and then uh, making sure that we are dealing with the folks in our own small organization the best way we possibly can before we dare to tell schools of medicine and hospitals and health systems, how they might consider things. One of the things that we did in our strategic planning process was to um, uh, establish a new entity called the AAMC Center for Health Justice. And one of the first things that the center did was develop a group of uh, community uh, voices, if you will, discover those voices around the country in a group called CHARGE. I can never remember what the acronym stands for, but in interacting with these uh, uh, voices, with these experiences around the country, they came up with 10 principles of trustworthiness that have to do with the communities we serve. And uh, uh, for all three of us, 
we grew up and have existed in academic medicine thinking about the tripartite mission of education, research, and patient care. We believe that community collaboration needs to be added as an equal fourth pillar. And um, uh, how often in past years I've talked about, uh, quote, educating the community. So here's a couple of uh, principles of trustworthiness that have been very well received so far. The first one is the community is already educated. That's why it doesn't trust you. Mm -hmm. Another one is you're not the only experts. In other words, the people experiencing a problem or a way of living that causes problems or leads to them are also in the best position to help think about solutions. And um, another one is um, without action, your organizational pledge is only performance. And at first blush, these may seem a, a little harsh, but the idea was to have us listen to what the people whose voices we need to listen to want to tell us. And so we're trying to pay attention to that concept of health justice across the board as much as possible. And I will tell you, even after uh, nearly a half century in, in medicine, I'm learning anew from the things coming out of the, of the uh, Center for Health Justice and other parts of the AAMC. And very glad to share, um, maybe I can figure out how to put it in the chat, a, a link to the uh, principles of trustworthiness. I'll see if I can figure out how to do that real quick. And if you can't, we can figure out a way to put it on our website afterwards. Okay. Oh, there it is. Wow. So. Oh, so I, I wanna, I'm gonna recognize Kristen Zipay is a fabulous researcher and, uh, and writer um, who, um, if, if you ever don't like one of my presentations, it's because <laughs> I flubbed it. If you ever do like it, it's because Kristen helped organize it. And she somehow snuck into this to make sure that even when I forgot to have the link, it's there. Uh, thank you, Kristen. <laughs> thank you, David. Lee, I, I'm gonna take this a little bit further. And um, sometimes when I'm doing my scanning about, you know, what's in the news and things, there has been criticism in some corners that emphasis on diversity, equity, and justice is harming the atmosphere of medical schools. And that it's, uh, not going to be a good thing for the quality of our education. And some are using the term in a pejorative manner that we're creating a woke environment that is contrary to a sound education. What are your thoughts on that kind of criticism? You know, I, I think there's some reality in that criticism. Um, if, first of all, anything that, that merges DEI and response and wokeism, those, those are such separate things. So I think the first mistake there is to put all of those in the same lump sum, um, which is a problem. Wokeness may be a response by some people to lack of diversity. And so I think separating those things out is the first thing. Second thing, addressing wokeness. And you know, I, I can say things as a brown, black, gay guy that other people can't say, right? Um, which is unfortunate, the same way that women can say things, sometimes that men can't. And, you know, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but my concern about wokeness is that it, it, it increases polarization at times, um, that it makes it, the qualities we were talking about earlier is being able to have a growth mindset, being able to be vulnerable and learn. And I think, you know, lifelong learning means that you recognize that there are things you do and you don't understand um, and that there may be other people that look different you, than you or think differently than you or look like you, but think differently. I mean, the diversity is, is defined in so many different ways that, that, could be problematic or you're missing maximizing things if you don't have exposure to and thinking about things like that. So, but wokeness in and of itself, I think it began as a early on as a recognition of the spectrum of, of inequities and uh, healthcare and otherwise racial, as far as who's safe, who isn't, um, who goes to prison, who doesn't for the same kinds of thing. And it's taken on like many things do that when human beings touch them in our culture is it's taken on a whole nother thing and a, and a cause for that. And anything, anytime something gets um, sort of 
codified as, you know, you're either in this or you're not, as opposed to the gray areas, that becomes problematic. So my concern with wokeness, as I said, it's worsening polarization. We don't need more, more polarization in this country or around the world. It shuts people down. If I wanted to, you know, design a way that would prevent us from moving forward um, around very challenging topics and having very challenging conversations, which is the only way you have to go through that to get to solutions and to work together. I would set it up so that I shut people down by having them being afraid that they're going to be called pick the ism or the phobia uh, phobic that they're going to be called that. I think the focus needs to be more on how do we have difficult conversations? The world's a diverse place. Look at the demographics in this country. Um, and you know, I don't feel the need to explain to everybody why diversity is important. Actually, I sort of do because I feel like how many times can we explain this? But you're not the best that you can be without diversity. It brings and you know it invigorates processes. It brings in new new um, outlooks. And as as you said, David you learn so much. I mean, decades doing something, you discover there are new ways to look at it, be it age, diversity, whatever. Um, and it's the only way we can address challenging issues, uh, I think. So I understand. The other thing is change is difficult and working with people that are different is difficult. It's challenging. Um, and so I think we have some responsibility as educators and as institutions to not only move things, the needle forward with diversity. And I actually put equity and inclusion before diversity because diversity without equity and inclusion is problematic. Um, we, we need to do them all, all at the same time. Um, but thinking about how do we move things forward and our responsibility is to address doing that, but also address people around change management, their fears, which are legitimate. These are scary times for people. And, as physicians, we perhaps are, you know, along with colleagues in policy and law and our colleagues in healthcare, nursing, social work, physical therapists, musical therapists, we're uniquely positioned to address those fears and those concerns and move things forward. Um, so I think it's, I understand why people say that it's, it's, it's changing things because the, those are the people feeling shut down. Um, and that's not a good feeling. This is such an important question. Uh, I mean, all these questions you've asked, Dr. Sheen, are important. Uh, this is way up there on the list today. And um, honestly, Dr. Jones, uh, this is such an important answer that you gave. I would just add a couple more thoughts, one quite tangential, but I think somewhat related. Um, you, you implied, but didn't say right out that, um, well, I, I guess you did say that shutting people down, that's the term you used. And I think threading the needle um, as I, I tried to mention earlier, but you said it much more powerfully, between free speech and trying to do the right thing is, is a very, very, very careful balance. And thinking back on my higher ed uh, a career and, and being uh, the great um, blessing of being president of two research universities, um, this has been a thing that we've struggled with in universities right up to the minute, is if there's speech that's going to be hurtful, I'm not talking about um, uh, yelling fire in a crowded theater, the old the, the classic saw, but things that will that will wound people. We obviously want to want to make things uh, as as safe as possible, safe an environment. That's all part of the, in my view, the inclusion part. Of what Dr. Jones was talking about. At the same token, if we erase opinions, um, we're going to be in big trouble. And um, if I could pronounce the author's name, I would do it, but I'm, I'm in the middle of a fascinating new book on the history of free speech. It starts in, in Athens, but it's not all, all Eurocentric. It travels through time right up to the present. And the more I read this book, the more convinced I am that free speech is a very, very important thing. That sounds so stupid because we're supposed to stand for free speech, but some of the problems that Dr. Jones has pointed out actually get in the way of free speech. They get in the way of free speech. So that's one thing I would mention. The other thing I would say to the other aspect, Dr. Sheehan, of your question, and that is, what do we say when people say, you know, you shouldn't be teaching all this stuff, it's garbage and so on, which some people, including prominent people have said, I always say the data will set you free. The data shows yeah. that social determinants of health is the biggest single determinant of health. 
You can have a different opinion if you want, but you can't have your own facts. The facts are that these social determinants and their precursors are the largest determinants of health. And so if we want to follow evidence, which is supposed to be where we're coming from, we will think about these issues, including but not limited to racism, as things that we have to do for the public health, for the public good. And if we're here to help people and to make them healthy and to have them enjoy a life as much as, as possible, we have to think about these broad, broad issues and not go backwards to a time where this evidence wasn't in. It's abundant, it's uncontestable, it's there. And so let's face that reality as our great schools of medicine are doing, which is why you're seeing some backlash. They've realized the evidence and they're moving forward, moving forward to make sure that students are exposed. And if I may say, also in, in reference to something that Dr. Jones said early on, which was very important to restate it a different way. So we have our college years, we have you know four years of med school, we have several years of residency. Then the real big stretch comes, which is when your formal training is over, continuing professional development, CME, whatever you like to call it. That's the next frontier in my mind. How mm -hmm. do we keep up with that and learn these things far beyond exposure to the curriculum. And we can get into a bubble in academic medicine that most of our, most of our graduates are not gonna be academicians. They're gonna be doing the greatest thing that they can do, which is the sanctity of human life. And so um, I think we have to think broadly about that and we have the tools to do it. And I believe we have the mandate to do it as well. So thanks, I'll get off my soapbox now. It was a great soapbox. I appreciate Thank it. You. I mean, it's it makes me think about evidence-based justice <laughs> as an essential part of evidence-based medicine. Um, you know, I want to thank both of you for this discussion, for both of you for taking time. Um, it's been a privilege over the last 10 months to get to know Lee. Um, he's a lot of fun, by the way. And uh, also, Dr. Scordon, I, I know you're really busy, and I sort of hit you up out of the blue. So I appreciate you agreeing to do this. And I hope we get to see more of you at Georgetown and uh, see if we can continue a wonderful relationship that we started today. I'm, I'm so honored that you asked me and I just wanna, I'm, I'm typing in the chat for Kristen to pay if she's still on. Uh, one of the folks in the chat asked if we could <laughs> share information on preview, hoping Kristen can quickly throw a link. Uh, we just had an, an article in one of our publications about the preview exam. And Kristen, if you can find it, then people can, can dive into it. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you for the honor of being here. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for letting me uh, share, the, share the stage with you. It's been a complete pleasure. Um, two of my favorite people on the planet. Why wouldn't I uh, jump at the chance to be with both of you? So thank you both very much. For the next part of our symposium, we're going to have a conversation with two of our Georgetown students. Uh, with Taylor Carver, who is at the Georgetown University School of Nursing, and with um, Mr. Dylan Williams, who's one of our Georgetown medical students. Uh, both Dylan and Taylor were part of our Pellegrino Student Scholar Program, which engages um, students from the medical school and the nursing school at a variety of different levels. Um, to look at some of the work uh, that Dr. Pellegrino did and then to apply that work in the development of an essay. Um, so both Dylan and Taylor were the winners of the essay contest this year. For the next part of our discussion, I'm going to ask Dr. David Miller, who is my colleague, my friend, and the Director of Ethics Education at the Medical School to moderate this discussion. And David, just for purposes of housekeeping, when you have finished with the discussion, finish the symposium. Don't come back to me. I'm going to be watching. I'm going to relax a little bit and listen. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Miles. <laughs> so um, Dylan and Taylor, if you'd uh, go ahead and turn on your cameras, please, um, so that I can introduce you. Thank you. Great to see you. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to also um, acknowledge that uh, Dr. Claudia Sotomayor and Dr. Sarah Vatone uh, sort of co-lead this extracurricular project. It, which we call the Pellegrino Student Scholars Program. Um, and uh, they are attending as well, but only one of us is going to do the question and answers. And I, got, I was fortunate enough to have worked with both of these students. So I'm uh, the one who's going to just ask them to uh, 
help us understand what their, their papers were about and tell us a little bit about themselves. Um, both students um, structured their essays around what Dr. Pellegrino identified as the three central moral phenomena of medical and nursing and healthcare practice. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna talk about that just very briefly to list, list those three phenomena because that, that, that will help structure the discussion a little bit. And then I'm gonna introduce the two, the two students out, out one at a time and go through their papers, ask them some questions and have them introduce themselves. Um, so the three phenomena that, that Pellegrino pointed to were the fact of illness, the active profession, and the fact of medicine. And the fact of illness really refers to patients, the patient's um, inherent vulnerability and reliance upon the healthcare professional for, um, for assistance when they're ill and when they're, uh, they don't know how to care for themselves, they, they need assistance from someone. And so the fact of illness brings about an existential crisis and it's, uh, it, it characterizes and, and underlies all of, the med all of medical practice. So it's important to bear that in mind. The, um, the active profession, Dr. Point, Pellegrino pointed out, was um, refers to the fact that people, that healthcare professionals take an oath, and when they do so, when they make a public profession and become a professional, they are professing that they have the competence and skills that they've developed over their educational um, career, and that they will use those skills and, and abilities and competencies um, for the patient's good. So that's what the active profession refers to, uh, that sort of promise uh, of a professing of a, of a promise to help patients. And then the fact of medicine refers to the physician patient or healthcare professional patient relationship um, in which they participate in shared decision making um, in order to determine and um, carry out the right and good healing act. Um, right referring to when we, when we say the right healing act, it means the medically or technically correct, uh, medically indicated treatment. Um, and then when we say the good healing act, the morally good healing action is the action that respects and corresponds to the patient's values and the patient's understanding of what the good life consists in. So those three phenomena are, go are going to structure each of their, their, their presentations today, I think. So um, I, I'm going to probably prompt them so it's just to help keep it informal I didn't want to we, we didn't really want to just have a, a reading of a paper we thought that it would be better to have a, a just a little bit of an informal discussion so I'm going to ask some questions and, and go about uh, this in that way so I think I'm going to start with with, with Taylor Carver um, Taylor thank you so much for being with us would you please tell me a little bit about tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what sparked your interest in Dr. Pellegrino's works? So all the students that joined the Pellegrino Student Scholar Program applied. We selected twelve, um, and you were one of those twelve. And please tell us about yourself. You want to unmute your your mic? Thank you. Hi. So my name is Taylor Christie Carver. I am from Poughkeepsie, New York. I graduated um, with my undergraduate from Stony Brook University, which is in Long Island. I'm currently in the Certified Nurse Midwifery Program and Women's Health Nurse Practitioner Program. Um, I started my nursing career at Weill Cornell, which is in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And there I had an abundance of resources. We were staffed well, we were very innovative, um, and I was very spoiled. I didn't know that until I started travel nursing. Um, and I would go to other areas that did not have resources um, that were not innovative and really didn't care for the population the same way that um, the populations in the Upper East Side were um, treated. And, you know, you hear about all of these things in school, but to actually see it, um, it hurts. Um, so when I got the, the email about Dr. Pellegrino and ethics and the healing relationship, um, I really wanted to be a part of that because I think one of the biggest things that is missing is um, treating everybody with um, moral value and dignity. Thank you. Um, so just uh, I, I, tell us about the title of your of your essay. What what was the title and and how did you select that? What did you mean by your title? So uh, my title is "I Promise to Heal: A Call for Good Trouble." Um, I promise to heal goes with the oath that all of us healers um, make when we when we decide to go into nursing school or medical school. And a call for good trouble is is not my own. It comes from the late John Lewis about. Um, 
getting into good trouble for, um, for others' behalf. Um, our history shows that to make progress, um, it, it comes with resistance. And on the other side of that resistance is usually um, beauty, but um, it comes with good trouble. Thank you. Um, so now I'm just going to ask you to tell us a, a bit about your paper. I think that to help you out, I'm just going to refer back to those three phenomena that I laid out at the very beginning of our, at the intro to this section. So um, let's talk with the, let's start with the fact of illness. Like how, what, what did you say in your essay about the fact of illness? How did you relate that to your research and your interests? Okay, so I'm just gonna back up really quick. So I'm a labor and delivery nurse. Um, and again, I do a lot in women's health. Um, so when looking at um, how women, black women specifically are treated and comparing it to what Dr. Pellegrino um, says is needed to come to develop a healing relationship, I seen that um, a lot of African-American women were simply not being listened to. Um, there, there's a lot of evidence that shows that they're underdiagnosed and they're undertreated. Um, history has showed that um, there's been experiments on them and there's been a lack of consent, which has created a lack of uh, trust in this community. Um, one of the big things that, we've, um, that has made the news was um, when Serena Williams went to the hospital, she ended up having a pulmonary embolism and she had had it before. So she knew the signs and symptoms and yet they still did not believe her. Um, other cases such as Charles Johnson, his wife um, who was internally bleeding after a C-section, he's seen signs and he, he's a lay person, but he was still going and, and complaining and complaining and nobody would listen to him. And his wife unfortunately passed away. Um, but to get to the healing re relationship, when a person comes with a chief complaint, we must listen to them. So if this population is not being listened to, then this, this relationship cannot even start. Great, thank you. How about the, the, the active profession? How, how um, to that? Okay, so um, kind of what you spoke about before, the active per, the profession starts with the oath that we take as healers. So um, that's where I came up with, I promise to heal. And when you take that oath, you make a promise to habitually seek a moral understanding to habitually um, try to be good. But unfortunately, America's history shows that that is not, that's not what happens and that there is um, a divide between um, white Americans and black Americans. And there, the only time our country's ever had a civil war was when we tried to integrate the two. So I almost would say it's irresponsible to think that creating a policy is going to change the hearts and the minds of people um, because it's the people who, who have to um, carry out these policies. And it can, we can see that this is not happening in the evidence and the increased maternal mortality rate in our black and um, black mothers and children. There's also a study by Kathari that was done in 2016, trying to figure out um, why there's such a disparity in the birth weight of African American um, babies. And what she found was, you know, it didn't matter how much African American women made or how successful they were, they still had poor outcomes when compared to their white counterparts. The only time that this was neutralized or equal is when they lived in a community that was um, a lot, that was like them. Um, so what that tells you is that we're uncomfortable around each other. We don't know how to be in, um, around each other and it makes us sick. And we still end up having these bad outcomes despite good social economic status. Now, I'm not saying that we should live separate, but I think it's important, it's vital that we learn how to live together because it's making us sick not knowing how to live together. Thank you. Um, finally, let's talk about sort of the act of medicine or of nursing or of healthcare. Um, so I think the, the act of medicine or healing um, is a tethering of the first two. So understanding and listening to the chief um, concern and then taking away your bias and being able to um, help this person based off of just their illness and not what they look like. So if you cannot do the, if you cannot complete the first two steps, then the healing relationship cannot, um, it cannot it cannot happen. And what we're doing when this doesn't happen is we're reducing the, the human experience and the life experience of the illness in an African-American person. And that 
I think that has caused an untethering of specifically Black women from body and self um, because they feel some type of way inside, but the world does not look at them that way. So when they're sick or they feel something, um, they don't know how to com they don't know how or when to come because they are always looked at as a strong Black woman. I have to be strong. I have to endure because that is what history has said. Um, so not only are they not being treated, they don't even know when to seek treatment, which means whatever the evidence is saying you, that should be done for this illness, it's not being done because people don't think that they're worthy of it. And then the Black women themselves don't know when to get it. Thank you. So I can see that there's, they sort of second guess themselves or hold them up to themselves up to a standard of these, these things. I wouldn't say it's so much of a second guessing, but... Um, putting it on the back burner. I can do this, I can endure, plus I have a whole plethora of other roles that I have to um, make up for due to mass incarceration and discrimination and all of these other things that I, I cannot be who I wanna be, whether that be you know a nurse or a, a pilot, I have to be you know this, this pivotal role in my family and what society sees me as, which is, you know, just this, this strong Black woman in this community. Great, thank you. So uh, a last question that I'll ask you, and, I, and um, people can post, I, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but you can post questions for both of our student scholars in, in the question and answers section. I'll, I'll be monitoring those and asking those at the end. Um, but so my last question for, for, for me would be, um, clearly, you see the health professions is facing multiple moral challenges in terms of ensuring equitable treatment of minor for minority populations. What do you think can be done, and how does Dr. Pellegrino's work inform your inform your reflection? Um, I think what needs to be done is I think the three phenomena that he has put together to form a healing relationship is perfect. It's just not happening. So the first thing that needs to happen is number one, we have to stop getting lost in the messenger, the messenger because we're missing the message. So we're so focused on who is sitting in front of us that we don't even realize what their illness is. Number two is follow the, um, follow the evidence. The evidence shows that it has nothing to do with socioeconomic status, that it is this weathering effect that this, this years and generations of discrimination is causing us to be sick. And there's actually a correlation between shorter telomeres between African-American and um, white women at the same age, which, which shows that the, all of the stress that's putting on us is literally causing us to be sick. It doesn't matter how rich you are or how smart you are. The fact that I feel uncomfortable all the time, it's, it's making me sick. And that is what the evidence says. And I know you guys were talking about um, wokeness before, sorry. Um, but I think that for me, what that means is that this is, this is not new. The Heckler report came out years and years ago and they said, there's something wrong. And I feel like people kind of need to wake up to the fact that it's racism and people just don't want to call it what it is. That's, that's what it is. That's what the evidence shows. And we have to work on changing the hearts and minds of people. Um, so they want to save people and not just specific people. So that's kind of what that, that means to me. I understand that it can get lost sometimes, but I think for some people, it just needs to be like, this is what it is. This is what the evidence says. And it should be treated almost like a cancer, um, racism and discrimination, because it, the evidence shows that it's killing people slowly. Um, and I think that all of us as healers need to habitually seek morality and, and habitually seek um, to be courageously good because if we're not self-reflecting during our work, we're gonna miss our implicit biases. We all have them, we shouldn't feel bad for them. The only time you should feel bad is if you choose not to work on them. Great, thank you very much. It was great working with you, and, and uh, I really enjoyed your essay, and I, I really appreciate your, your speaking up to us today. Um, we'll, we'll come back with, and see if there are questions from the audience at the end. Um, but thank you. I'm going to now, now turn to Dylan. So Dylan Williams um, was our other, both of these students won our, uh, shared our prize, our first, uh, first, first place prize. And so, um, William, uh, Dylan, would you please tell us about yourself and your background and what sparked your interest in Dr. Pellegrino's work? Sure. So my background in, in undergrad, I actually studied uh, philosophy and classics, uh, and I ended up minoring in biochemistry, which is all to say that 
primarily I studied philosophy. And the thing that really drew me to philosophy was looking at issues within society, those social issues, those structural issues, those political issues, economic issues. And as I was working, I kept coming back to the fact that healthcare was such a central component of this and all of those things were affecting healthcare and that healthcare couldn't be divorced from these things. Because when you start to look at these issues as, as singular issues, you lose the fact that everything's an interconnected web. Um, and that made me really choose to leave my career uh, in philosophy and decide to go to medical school to really work within those healthcare systems and try and enact change with Truman and bring that knowledge of those systems that I had studied um, in philosophy to medicine. And so naturally, looking at Dr. Pellegrino as one of the founders of bioethics, I was very interested in his work and I wanted to see what he had to say about these things. He is not only a physician, but a philosopher, which is something that I hope to be. And it's something that is definitely a rarity um, in our society today. And I think that looking at what Dr. Pellegrino has done and taking those disparate perspectives and combining them and kind of synthesizing them and to answer some of these really important questions is something that's really invaluable. So studying someone who founded the field and who was able to straddle those two uh, somewhat disparate fields into, into one thing um, was what drew me to Dr. Pellegrino in the first place. Great, thank you. So your essay focuses on a, a close reading in response to a, one particular of, of Dr. Pellegrino's essays. Um, what particular ed essay was that? And can you tell me a bit about that? And then um, you bring him into conversation with Richard Rorty um, which may seem to be an unusual um, dialogue partner. So um, why don't you tell me first about what, which essay interested you and, and what was it that interested you in that essay? And then, then I'll ask you about Richard Ward. Sure. So one of the things that I was looking at initially when I looked at Dr. Pellegrino's writing was what he had to say about, again, these, these issues and what we're really doing when we're making decisions in ethics, because that's what I really care about is practical issues practical application of philosophy to contemporary issues. And I focused on one of his later essays. Um, it was one of the works, one of the last works that he really had on this topic, which was bioethics at centuries turn, can normative ethics be retrieved where he was talking about normative ethics in a postmodern or contemporary world. Um, and in this essay, Dr. Pellegrino suggested that the field of clinical medical ethics ought to focus its reflections on its own philosophical roots and on the actual practice of medicine lest it become a cacophony of arguments and mostly theoretical discussions among the various non-medical disciplines that like to engage in discussions uh, about bioethics. So while Dr. Pellegrino argued or, or agreed that uh, medical ethics must remain in conversation with all of these other disciplines that like to write about medical ethics and bioethics, um, and he agreed that we needed those perspectives, he argued that it must remain grounded upon some philosophical foundations and that those philosophical foundations give primacy to, to medicine and to medical ethics. Um, and I could talk about his relation to Rorty or- Oh, sure, go ahead. Sure. So as a, as a postmodern philosopher he, uh, and primarily a political philosopher, Richard Rorty did not focus his writing on medicine specifically, but nevertheless, his work focuses primarily on the radical contingency um, of human existence and the human need for solidarity as a means to cope with the frustration and the suffering that results from that contingency of where we find ourselves in, in the world, in society, all of the things that make us who we are, all of the things that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, moreover, he felt that the true value in philosophy actually lied in the implementation of practice over theory. So while Richard Rorty may at first seem like an unusual choice to bring into dialogue with Pellegrino, um, in examining the thoughts that he did throughout his career, uh, and the ideas that he did, uh, he slotted almost perfectly into the profile of the postmodern uh, philosophy that Pellegrino himself in this essay wrote about wanting to engage with. So he actually became a, a very good mirror for what Pellegrino was talking about. And it, it created a really easy uh, place for discourse and to really merge these two ideas together. Hey, thank you. So, so let's go through, so I, I think that the way that you sort of bring them together is, is, is really, really works through those three phenomena that, that we discussed earlier. So tell us about so how does the fact of illness, how does Pellegrino see it? How does Rorty see it? How did, how did you bring them into conversation? Where do they overlap uh, in that, with that concept? Sure, so one of the things that, as I was saying before, and also that Taylor 
talked about was that, you know, regardless of the differences in religious, political, economic, and other beliefs, there is, the, it remains the fact of illness, the act of profession, um, and the act of medicine. And when we talk about the act of, or the, the fact of illness, a lot of what we're talking about is, is the contingency that someone is in, the, the way that they suffer, the way that they feel, what suffering means to them. And that is something that is inherent to medical practice. Um, when we're talking about the act of profession, we're talking about the physician promising to provide skilled care for the good of the patient. And when we talk about the act of medicine, we're talking about the fulfillment of that promise. And we're also talking about a, a shared intentionality. And that really grounds the philosophy of medicine and the philosophy of clinical medical ethics for Pellegrino. And that's something that really could be expanded to Rorty and Rorty's ideas of solidarity and his ideas of contingency really can be seen as extensions of those ideas from Dr. Pellegrino. So in my essay, I argued that Dr. Pellegrino's focus on the fact of illness and the vulnerability that it entails is in many ways akin to Rorty's focus on, on that contingency um, that I talked about earlier. And I also argue that Dr. Pellegrino's focus on the active profession, meaning uh, a physician promising to use his or her specialized training and knowledge, and as well as the active medicine in which a physician seeks to engage in that shared decision-making, uh, those are inherently moral grounds, and those are also inherently uh, akin to Rory's focus on the importance of solidarity as a core of any sort of practice when you're making an ethical decision. Great, excellent. I, I, I think that uh, that's a great point. I, it, it's, I see so much, in, in many ways, there's a sort of overlap between what the, your arguments and what, what Taylor argued as well, right? Especially in terms of solidarity and, and sort of making people, helping people, Making them feel accepted and and um, part of a community, and that how that allows them to really be treated and to and to be to, to engage in the act of medicine. Um, so that's great. Thank you. Um, so, what sort of challenges to medical eth ethics does uh, your essay identify and address, and what remaining issues or themes do you do you think should be addressed in the future? So just to go back to what you just said and then also answer what you just asked, that is kind of the, the thing that, that Pellegrino and Rory are really kind of looking at because one of the issues that Pellegrino brings up in this paper is how do you deal with a multicultural globalist society? How do you deal with a pluralist ethics? And what, is it, what does that mean to have these best practices of, of clinical medical ethics when you have all of these different cultures from around the world? And what does that mean to individual people and that's really where Rorty comes in with that solidarity because you have to take someone as they are and you meet them where they are and you and you practice the best of your ability, those medical clinical ethics. And that's where I saw the real value of solidarity. So to answer the question that you just asked, I think one of the challenges um, that I identify in the essay and that I think the use and the value really comes out of this essay is that by flipping the script, so to speak, and looking at the ethical questions, not from a framework of what we shouldn't do or what we may only hope to discover uh, with recent medical inventions and new scientific technology, we actually flip the script and focus on the idea of what we could do for a future community uh, that's characterized by this increased solidarity. And then in that way, we gain the ability to face novel problems in novel ways, while at the same time remaining guided by an identifiable moral compass, which is those kind of phenomena that Pellegrino talks about. Um, when he talks about the foundations of, of medical philosophy, uh, adopting an approach like this is obviously going to come with its own set of problems and each of those problems you need to take in stride. And the, the utility of, of this practice is that it's much more prepared to answer each of those problems through its own self-modification by looking at this individual and contextualized contingency and solidarity than trying to maintain and stay completely anchored to sort of foundationalist principles that really make you stay kind of within a cage of decision-making because you can't go outside of those principles when you can context recontextualize and recontextualize in individual situations that allows for much better and easier ways to make clinical uh, decisions and to really have more fruitful um, ethical discussions and discourse. Um, sorry. No problem. I'll come, I'll come back to you. I'll I'll, I'll go back. I'll, I'll give Taylor another question, and then I'll come back to you and ask you a final question if you'd like, or would you like to? Okay. <laughs> so Taylor, so 
Um, I'm wondering it, what what you see as so some of the questions that were asked in the in the lack of the last panel were like how can we choose do we how can we choose better students or how do we um, incorporate ways of of um, addressing this the solidarity and helping people to bridge this gap what 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 do you think is is a, a prescription for making helping nursing and, and medicine to be more um, equitable and more effective. So are you asking for admission? Like how do you pick better students? Not I'd better say, students, but. Well, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm actually asking just broadly. So what do you think that we need to focus on admission? Do we need to, is there, do we need to focus more? You, you've gone through nursing school and now you're in graduate school. Do, you, do we need to focus on education? Do we need to focus on selection? Do we need to, what, and, and, and what do we do with people who are, are practicing? So in the earlier session, someone in the Q&A, so I, I was feeding the questions to Dr. Sheehan, but um, we didn't get to ask all of them, but what someone had said, what do we do about older physicians who, um, you know, to help them to become more sensitized? Uh, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on any of those, those issues. I think, um, number one, we need to make sure we diversify all workplaces um, because if we are, if we know that we're uncomfortable around each other, it's because we're not around each other. Um, there's a good book, Talking to Strangers, and it just, and it goes through why we just don't even know how to communicate because we take things out of context. Um, but if you, if you break bread with somebody consistently who is different than you, then you can learn to see them as a human being rather than just other. Um, I think also um, in academics, I think we focus a lot on academics. I don't know about medicine, but in nursing, um, the smartest nurse is not always the best nurse um, because sometimes you are missing that teamwork component and that compassion component. So when we um, would do interviews, it would not just be about your GPA. It's how do you work in teams? Um, what type of leader or follower are you in a team? Do you only lead or do you follow as well? And, you know, what things do you, what things do you, what things do you participate in? Where have you been? Um, things that you've been involved in and making sure that, you know, you are trying, you purposely picking people from different backgrounds. It doesn't have to be just based on color. It could be um, based on class. Um, I would say most other countries do base a lot of their things on class. Here in America, we base a lot of things on race. Um, even the fact that I have to be called a minority, you know, I'm already other. I'm already always going to be other. Um, and, you know, I just went to Jamaica with my family and their motto is out of many, there's one people. And I think if we can get to that place, then, then we would have different issues rather than just this huge uncomfortability on what type of American are you? And I'm gonna judge you based off of that. And it puts people in these boxes where they can't even flourish and live up to their potential because they're trying to live up to the stereotype that America has put on them. So I think if I think the biggest thing is creating diversity and then in the workplace, having diversity enforcement, um, having people call out bad behavior, that's the good trouble. When you are amongst people who look like you, I know people here and see bad things. Now, do you sit and listen to it or do you call it out? Because if you sit and listen to it, you are just as bad. And that takes courage. It's not easy. Great. Thank you. I, it's um, something you said also made me think about another question that was asked. Um, and, and part of the impetus for the, for the Pellegrino student scholars was to have some interdisciplinary interaction between nursing and medical students uh, more than, than, than occurs. I know that Georgetown is trying to encourage more interprofessional education. Um, and I think that that, that, that also helps. So, so it's, it's not really in terms of equity and discrimination, things like that, but it, in terms of breaking bread with the people that you're going to be working on, working on teams and also leaders and followers, it's like learning the different styles and what the roles are. I think that's that's probably something important too, I, I would imagine. And you probably have experienced that from having, you know, practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. So um, if there are other questions, I, you know, people are welcome to put questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I'm gonna go back to Dylan and, and ask you um, what may be the last question unless we have other questions. Um, and uh, so I think that you and I had discussed the, the, the fact that um, much of medical ethics, Dylan, is focused on the, the four principle approach, which is really the sort of Beecham Childress, 
um, principles of autonomy, the respect for autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Um, and I wondered what, what your thoughts are on um, whether solidarity is, is, is how, do you think that that falls under the category of beneficence or do you think that it ought to be added or um, what, what do you think about that? And also whatever, I, I know that we sort of, you were, you were having some, uh, some issues. So I thought, um, you know, whatever you were gonna say earlier, if you wanted to continue that line of thought and then answer this question, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, it's been a, I woke up with a sore throat. I've been having trouble talking all day, but um, right. what I was going to say actually, funny enough about addressing themes in the future was about the four principles. Um, what I was going to say was that one theme that could be addressed in the future is the idea of adding solidarity as some sort of guiding light or glue that holds the fourth principles together, if not being a fifth principle, because we talk about the four prima facie principles of medicine being respect for autonomy, Benef uh, beneficence, uh, non malfiescence and justice, and a lot of issues that contemporary uh, ethicists have within bioethics kind of come down to looking at those four principles and saying, well, you know, is that is that really it? There's something missing here. There's something because, and you can come up with all sorts of thought experiments um, as to as to these issues and 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 create issues. And I think that if you add in solidarity, it really plugs a lot of those holes. Um, because one of the main conclusions, even of my paper, uh, is that ultimately both of these thinkers, Richard Rorty as a postmodern political philosopher, and even Dr. Pellegrino as more of a, a traditional um, ethicist uh, and physician, they both agree, regardless of their starting points, on the centrality of human vulnerability, of contingency within that vulnerability, of the interdependence of these systems and the need to respond to the things that threaten human life and the things that threaten flourishing. And they both want to expand solidarity in their own ways as widely as they possibly can in order to reduce human suffering. Um, and while using that agreement as a foundation for bioethics isn't going to solve all of the disputes among contemporary bioethicists, I think that it is really going to go, go a long way in providing uh, a strong starting point for a productive dialogue that at this point is missing in a lot of areas and a way for people to, to come to the table and sit together and, and break bread together and have these conversations um, in solidarity with each other and really recognize where the disagreements arise and then look at those disagreements and, and focus on those things and say, okay, well, that's where we can have further discussion. But when we're agreeing on all of these other things, those are, those are practical things that can be implemented. Those are philosophical theories and ideas that we can actually implement into practice. If we're all in agreement on these things, there's no reason that we need to continue to disagree with each other and, and tear each other down and throw out our entire arguments when we have these these central components that we all agree on. Oh, thank you both. Um, thank you. Um, th so I'm sh I'm really happy that uh, that that we, you got to uh, present your papers. Um, I um, I will ask the question that was asked in, in the Q and A after a second, but I just wanted to to say how proud I am of both of you, and you know I'm so happy that. You, the, the two of you really represent Georgetown well, and yourselves, obviously. Um, you know, you both did really fantastic work, and I, I'm really happy, and I'm sure that the audience um, appreciates that and uh, can see how thoughtful and articulate you both are. Thank you. Um, let me ask a question. So there's a, there is a um, question from the Q&A, and, and this can, either of you can address this, or, or both. Um, so Dr. Allman asks, how can we reconcile the sort of rampant individualism of, with our, of our times with solidarity, that the idea that we're all in this together? Um, you know, how do we reconcile those things? I, 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 had, I actually had thought about the question, um, Dylan, when you said that we have to recognize pluralism, does pluralism pull, pull us away from solidarity um, would be sort of my way of, uh, of spinning that as well. Would you, would you like to respond to me? Taylor, if you'd like to, I'll have Dylan respond. And if you wanted to add anything, Taylor, I'll come back to you. At, okay. Sure. Um, this is something that I've thought about myself as well as something that actually 
funny enough, Richard Rorty has written about um, when he talks about solidarity and a lot of his political philosophy. And he comes up with this idea of something called uh, a private and public distinction, because I think that a lot of these disagreements come from people that have these individual ideas and these individual ways that they want to live their lives. And this, this idea, especially in this country of individualism, I mean, in America, it's very important to us. But we have to understand that trying to take those individual ideals and impose them on everybody else in society is where a lot of this disagreement and a lot of this um, suffering and a lot of this, this unnecessary argument comes from. When you can have your own individual life without imposing those views on other people, it's very different than when you have this public life that we can all agree. We all want to, we all want to not be, you know, tread on right by other people as, as th this is such an American ideal. But at the same time, we all want to be respected and taken as we are. And we all want to live in a society where we can coexist and we can agree on these things that are important and agree on things that people should have the ability to live their lives in this way and to not suffer. And when you really come down to that idea of solidarity, it's something that we all tend to fundamentally want. Um, so it's really just understanding where the line is between what needs to be done publicly in order to allow everybody to thrive and in order to reduce all of that suffering and where to take the things that you feel privately in, in, in your private life and not feel that every single idea that you have needs to be expressed on some grand political policy making stage where everybody has to conform to the ideals that you have as an individual that don't necessarily fit in with everybody else. It's, it's fitting the puzzle pieces that work together in order for everybody to, to thrive and, and to reduce that suffering. Thank you. Taylor, did you want to did you have something to add to that? You're, you're muted, sorry. Yeah, can I just have you repeat the question one more time? I'm sorry. So um, I think that maybe the way that this applies to your essay that, that, that I see, so the question I would have for you that's related is sort of, um, you know, um, in some ways there, we, we think about the importance of community, right? And community in that way, I think of community and solidarity being aligned, right? And we think of this, this, this sort of the, the, the cry of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity, or community, right? So um, I think that, you know, how do we support communities, but also um, recognize that, 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 that recognize individualism and pluralism? Do you see some sort of tension there? Um, or, or do they? Do they overlap? Is there a way to do that, or are they? Um, I think I think eventually it it can be done. Um, I think that in order for it to first start, there has to be a a baseline of equality and a base, and and that I think is what is so fundamental about ethics because ethics is supposed to be a foundation of equality, how everybody is supposed to be treated. Now, if you come from a place where you are already being treated well, and and things are um, ethically sound for you, then your individuality is great, you know, then you can separate yourself from the community. But if every day is a fight and a struggle for you to be treated ethically correct and to, to be able to pursue happiness in the American dream, then you really have no choice but to lean on the community and your government. Um, so I think until, and again, I think that kind of goes back to the wokeness of realizing that um, things are good for some people, but they're not good for other people. And, um, you know, our soil is different. Um, so if your soil is nice and fertile, then yeah, you can be an individual, but when, you're, when your soil is, is not fertile, and, and, you're in a, and you're in a place where you need to get your, your fertilizer from other people, then you're, you're screaming to the community and the government for help. And for centuries, they just haven't been, been listened to. So I think from my standpoint, I think we first need to come together as a country and a community and get, you know, to, I guess, more of a ground level, the stakeholders in the community and then the government to realize that they're ethically, we're not, we're not on, at a good place. Thank you, beautiful. I think that, I think you both did a fantastic job. Um, I think that that, that, uh, that is an, I'm looking at some of these uh, questions. That, okay, one more question. <laughs> um, so this is from Dr. Sotomayor. She asked um, for, so she's one of the people who um, directed the, the Pellegrino Student Scholar Program. 
she said, as students, what gives you hope with regard to the topics that you shared? What, what gives you hope? Um, so maybe I'll start with Dylan and then we'll come back to, to Taylor. How's that? Um, well, my hope actually is kind of the things that we discussed earlier, you know, um, with Dean Jones and the, the, the conversations that we're having here about, you know, talking about wokeness um, <laughs> that everybody wants to, to complain about in, in certain circumstances. When I walk around and I see my peers and I see the people that I'm in school with and, you know, the, my contemporaries, I guess, um, and I see the, the ideas that they have and the, the way that they value solidarity, the way that they value taking people as they are, what Taylor's talking about, wanting to break bread with people and understand that equity is an ongoing fight and it's something that we don't have yet. Uh, and we don't all have equality on, on one level. And the fact that everybody that I'm surrounded by um, and, and people from my generation are really seeing these things and, and grappling with them and coming to the table and trying to have these conversations. That's something that really gives me hope because it shows me that that they understand that there is a conversation to be had, and it, it also shows me that it that it's a conversation that they're willing to have and one that they may not have had an understanding of in previous generations. the The amount of communication that's happening nowadays is incredible, um, and the access that people have to this information, the access that these people have to discuss with each other and to kind of look at what could be done uh, to make things better. It, that's where my hope comes from. It's, it's, it's the hope that other people can have their minds changed and, and really take people as they are and understand how important this, this is and how important and ethical and necessary it is in order for us to continue to function as a society. Because at, at a certain point, it's just not working for some people and it's working for other people and it needs to work for everybody. Thanks. Taylor, would you, uh, what, what gives you hope? Um being here at Georgetown University, the fact that we're having these conversations, um, the fact that we're open to have it. I know um, the being a part of the midwifery um, program, we speak about all of these biases and being in the work the workforce already for almost seven years, when you speak about these things, you, you are look at, you're looked at as a troublemaker. Again, so back to the good trouble. You're always saying the things that you see, but people kind of, we're busy, we gotta keep going. Um, but being here at Georgetown and knowing that we're putting it into our education, especially in the nurse midwifery um, program, talking about weight bias and all these other things, um, that gives me hope that, you know, our um, the, the new providers uh, and advanced practitioners that are going out, they will put this into practice and they will give everybody um, the chance to be healthy because everybody wants to be healthy. Thank you. Um, so I am going to wrap up. Um, I, uh, I actually went much longer than, than Miles had actually told me to. So I, uh, we, had initially, we had initially planned to go to about 3.30. So we got an extra 15 minutes with you. Thank you so much. And thanks for your time and for your uh, your efforts um, and um, great work. Congratulations on your work. Um, and to everyone who's joining us, to, to the audience, thank you so much for participating with us. Um, we look forward to uh, seeing you at a future symposia and conferences. And we also look forward to um, great work from Taylor and Dylan and our other Pellegrino student scholars in the future. Um, thank you again and uh, everyone have a good day. <laughs>